I'm sure 2K's got me. Check one, two, three, four. Good? Okay, okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, thank you. Good morning. Hi, all. Good morning. Thank you for joining us on Azalea Fest weekend and finding your way back here. But um, so, hello, my name is Hannah. I'm the AmeriCorps Project Resilience Coordinator here at Cape Fear River Watch. If you're at our last seminar, you saw me. You might see a little bit more of me. But so, um, I just have a little information I want to share before we get started with our program today. So, I would first like to ask uh, Paul, you could just wave your hand. Paul's one of our current board members, so thank you. <laughs> I would also like to say thank you to TK. He's sitting there in the back doing all of our film stuff. He does it for all of our seminars, and it's just absolutely wonderful. If you don't get, if you if you by chance miss one, you can always check him out on our YouTube with with our film that we have. So, um, I want just have a couple things in past news I want to talk about. So we had a pickup and pint cleanup that we did with Mad Mole. Um, we had 32 volunteers collect over a thousand pounds of litter, which is always wonderful. We also were able to partner with some other fabulous environmental organizations and celebrate Creek Week a couple weeks ago. Um, if you missed out on Creek Week events, you can always check it out next year. Um, and then lastly, for our last March events, we were also able to reach over 150 50 youth in Wilmington through our field trips and eco tours just in March. So, okay, and then in the coming news. so. If you guys didn't know, tomorrow uh, at Good Hops Brewery in CB, we are holding our annual uh, Cape Fear River Watch Disc Golf Tournament. So if that interests you and you haven't signed up yet, there are still spots. Rob will be there. You might see him. So, um, And then we also are having our second Saturday cleanup as we do every month. Uh, do we have a location on that? Yeah, Squash Branch. Squash Branch. Squash Branch. Okay. Greenfield Lake. Greenfield Lake. Greenfield Lake Watershed. Um, and then we also have our second paddle of the year, if you guys weren't able to go on the first one. This one does require some experience. It is on the Black River, so if you guys are interested, there are still spots to sign up for that as well. Um, and then uh, we have uh, Earth Day weekend, Earth Day coming up soon, so make sure you get out and appreciate all your, all your awesome uh, natural areas and as well as attend some events and festivals that are going on that weekend. Um, and then just a couple more things. We are also hosting our second Burnwell Creek Eco Tour on Friday, April 19th. You can sign up on our website. I will be leading that so you get to spend more time with me. <laughs> okay, and then for our last thing, uh, we have our save the date for the Cape River Watch 30th birthday party, which will be May 31st at Brooklyn Arts Center. So keep that in mind. And then also, we are also selling T-shirts, sweatshirts, hats, all the good stuff. So if you guys are interested or... And I will also be taking donations, so just come find me after. Okay, now I will get to the good stuff. Yes. Yeah, yeah. okay, perfect. perfect. And then um, we also have our e-news. You can sign up for that. I believe I saw some of you sign in on that paper in there. If you didn't get a chance to but you're interested, make sure to sign up. Okay, so and now I will introduce Rob, and I'll read his official bio. So, <laughs> Rob Clark graduated from the University of North Carolina at Wilmington with a BS in environmental science with a specialization in conservation. He has experience in both the private and public sectors of the environmental field. He has worked from mountains to the coast and everywhere in between. He feels strongly about the environment, is looking forward to being able to serve his community as well as its ecosystems. He is currently the Water Quality Programs Manager here at Cape Fear River Watch, and he is a great coworker, so I will turn it over to him to now speak and give you guys a wonderful presentation. So. Thank you. Some of our prominent water quality programs um, that we run on a, a yearly basis. Um, first off, that's for you. That's the best. Yeah. So, full disclaimer, he's got a cold right now, so if my presentation is a little slow today, it's because I haven't slept a lot. Um, but uh, that's me, and obviously that's my son, Wyatt. He's eight months old yesterday, and he's the best. But he's pitiful right now. Um, so I'm the Water Quality Programs Manager at Cape Fear River Watch. Like Hannah said, I went to uh, UNC Wilmington. 
Um, I've got about 10 years of experience. Uh, I started out working uh, up in the mountains for the Appalachian District Health Department. Um, that's in Boone, North Carolina, if y'all are familiar where App State is. Um, uh -oh. <laughs> I mean, I have no, I don't, I, you know, I didn't become an App State fan, um, but they are pretty crazy up there. Um, but I did on-site wastewater work, so I did soil, soil science to design and permit um, septic systems and private drinking water wells. Um, after that, I came back to Wilmington, which is where I'm from, and did wetland delineation. So I worked for a private company defining the boundaries of wetlands. Uh, and then I worked at a private uh, environmental lab where I did field technician work. So basically sampling, uh, water quality readings, uh, all across the coastal plain, essentially. And then more recently, I'm obviously at Cape Fear River Watch and I'm coming up on three years now. So the first program I want to talk about is our Creek Watcher program. So Creek Watchers it is, is a citizen science program. Um, there's some of y'all are Creek Watchers in the audience right now. Um, but basically volunteers sample their local watershed uh, once a month and also fill out field reports. Uh, so we're sampling for bacteria essentially. And when y'all walked in, you walked right into our, right past our lab. Kind of looks like a kitchen right now, but normally it looks like a lab. Um, but we're sampling for E. coli bacteria in freshwater and sampling for Enterococcus bacteria in brackish water. And then we're also filling out field reports at the same time because those field reports kind of give us uh, the, the conditions of the day that people are sampling. So it gives us context to our sample. Um, so what is citizen science? So citizen science is the, is the collection and analysis of data relating to the natural world by members of the general public, typically as part of a collaborative project with professional scientists. So citizen science is important. Its main goal is to um, engage the, the public with certain science issues. In particular, we're looking at water quality issues, bacteria. Um, and so we want to you know, educate the public on water quality issues. You know, it helps people feel more connected with their own natural world in their backyard, which then you know, inevitably leads to people becoming um, advocates for their local environment. So again, what are we looking for? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, e. coli bacteria in freshwater and Enterococcus bacteria in brackish. We want to see where is this bacteria coming from. So E. coli and Enterococcus are natural. Uh, they incur, they, they uh, are in the guts of warm-blooded organisms. Uh, and so they come out and they make their way into our surface water via poop. <laughs> so that can be animal, it can be human, it can be, you know, uh, a discharge or it can just be surface runoff. Um, one of the major sources of uh, E. coli and Enterococcus bacteria that we see here in Wilmington is from pet waste. Um, and so obviously that's not directly discharged, but when pets uh, use the bathroom and it rains, that bacteria makes its way into uh, our local watersheds. Um, and then we're also looking at other issues as they arise. So just naturally with people being out there and volunteering, they're going to come across things that are, are alarming. Um, and so, you know, some of the, an example of this is uh, with the amount of construction we have in Wilmington, we see sediment pollution all the time. So Creek Watchers will document uh, a sediment plume due to a improperly installed silt fence or something like that. So we try and address those things as well, um, in addition to uh, documenting what type of bacteria we're seeing and how much. So volunteers, they take a sample. This is our IDEX sample vessel. If you can see that line right there, that's the 100 mil mark. I also have one right here. So folks will sample and fill that up to the 100 mil mark as we process all samples off 100 mils. Um, and then they fill out their field report and they drop off at uh, a cooler right out front right there. And then they pick up their gear for next month. So it's a self-sustaining cycle. Um, and, and then I do all the lab work or, or interns or other staff will do the lab work uh, to process those samples and give us the numbers that we're trying to figure out. And so what, that, what does that lab work look like? So essentially, and I brought some stuff since we're in the office. So this is the IDEX vessel. So I, if I were a creek watcher, I would go out and fill this up with whatever creek I'm sampling. And then I add, when, when I drop it off, I would do this work here in the lab where I'd add this reagent powder into the sample. And so this reagent powder goes into the sample and it dissolves in solution. <coughs> and what the reagent powder is designed to do is that sample will incubate. If you walk out, when you walk out, look to the right, there's two stacked ovens in there. Those are called incubators. And so both the E. coli and Enterococcus samples incubate at a very specific temperature. 
And during that incubation process, this reagent is physically binding with bacteria in the water. And so when it binds, it forms what's called an indicator, which is a growth on that bacteria. And the sole purpose of that indicator is to glow under a black light. So after I've dissolved my reagent in my sample, I put it in what's called a quanti tray. And so you can see these bubbles here. These are called wells. You have large wells and small wells. So when you put the sample in there, all the water is down there. You run it through a sealer, which seals this airtight and forces that 100 mil sample into all these different wells. And it incubates for 24 to 28 hours. And then I put it under a black light. And because that indicator is formed on some of those, in, on the bacteria in the water sample, some of these wells will be glowing. And then I use a formula to determine the ratio of large wells to small wells, which gives us our NPN, which stands for the most probable number of bacteria forming colonies. And that's a good picture right there. You can see these fluorescent. That, those are positive for, um, that looks like a, a, a saltwater sample. So those are positive for enterococcus bacteria. So that means that indicator is formed and they're glowing under a black light. So we have about 96 individual locations. About 40 to 35 are active a month. It's a volunteer run program. So you know, obviously we're not gonna have all 96 locations active every month. It covers 42 different watersheds. And in 2023, volunteers collected 383 samples with 53% uh, of our samples failed and 47% passed, which was actually a pretty decent year, believe it or not. We usually, uh, we're usually in the like 60% failure rate. So I don't know what happened. So the goals of the program. So the primary goal, again, is citizen science. We want to get folks engaged with water quality issues in their local environment. Um, the secondary goal is it gives us good quality baseline data. So this is not a regulatory program. I can't take this data and go to DEQ and say, hey, you know, we have a problem here. And that's for a couple different reasons. One reason, DEQ is very particular about their data, who collects it, and how it's processed. Um, I implement the same guidelines and the same uh, SOPs that I was taught at a state certified lab. So I feel good about this data, um, and I feel good about Creek Watcher's ability to, to correctly sample and our ability to correctly process. Um, but that being said, um, DEQ is not going to take our data uh, at face value. Um, but it's good for our internal use. Um, it's good to educate the public. Um, and then we have a, you know, the third goal is like kind of like that sediment issue, but it can expand out into further larger issues. Um, solve individual issues of pollution and sources, and I'll kind of get into that in a little bit. Um, but again, the primary goal is just to get folks out sampling, engage with their local environment. So a couple of program successes um, of recent. So uh, any of y'all familiar with Futch Creek? Anybody live around Futch Creek? It's up north. Um, it's probably one of the least polluted watersheds. Um, and that's probably because the development, I mean, it's up there now, but it hasn't quite gotten up there. Um, one thing I didn't get into, but with, you typically see elevated levels of bacteria in watersheds that have high levels of impervious surface, meaning when water falls on in that area, it's going to directly discharge in the creek without any sort of natural filtration. Um, and so Futch Creek has a lot, <coughs> excuse me, has a lot of green space. So it has a lot of, of natural filtration before that runoff makes its way into Futch Creek. That being said, we had years and years and years of elevated levels of enterococcus bacteria from a certain creek watcher site. Um, and we could not figure out where it was coming from. It's kind of really hard to find out where bacteria comes from because it can come from so many different sources. It's not necessarily always, it can be point source, but it's more often than not non-point source. So pinpointing where that bacteria come, is coming from is very difficult. Um, but yeah, we had years and years and years of maxed out. Every single whale, large and small, was glowing, um, which was odd because when I talked to other, um, you know, private companies that sample Futch Creek, they were like, that's really weird because we, that's the cleanest creek we sample. So Futch Creek, because the development has gotten there, there's still a lot of septic systems. I don't know if anybody, is anybody on a septic system now? I know we got one. Um, so the way a septic system works is when you flush a toilet, when you do your dishes, when you wash your clothes, all of that waste water is discharged into a centralized holding tank. And that tank has a baffle in it, a wall essentially, and it separates your solids and liquids. Your solids stay on the left-hand side to be pumped out. Your liquids go to the right-hand side and are discharged into what's called a drain field. And that essentially is a designed uh, field to disperse that wastewater onto the ground in an even manner 
um, across a large space. And as that wastewater filters down through the pores of the soil, in the pores, there are microorganisms that filter out pollutants. Um, that's why it's incredibly important to have that buffer zone, essentially. Um, good solid soil with good structure can be really good at treating uh, runoff. But they have lifespan, so you know, poop is really good at growing things, so it's going to grow what's called a biofilm on, on, on the drain field, and eventually that drain field becomes impervious, and where does the wastewater go then? It can go up and surface, it can kind of find its way out the side, it all depends, but either way it's not working properly. So we suspected that potentially we had a septic issue out there, so we developed an education campaign, developed um, pamphlets, um, distributed them door to door throughout the Fletch Creek community. The Creek Watcher out there, she went to all the community meetings, put it up on the community Facebook pages, and we haven't seen elevated, I mean, I couldn't figure out where the septic system was, but we haven't seen elevated levels of enterococcus from that site in probably two years now. And the timing was the exact same. So what I think happened was essentially somebody got the message, hey, I might need to check my septic system and fixed it because we haven't seen any elevated levels. So the next program success, which is ongoing, it's, it's a success but not quite finished yet, is we've had Creek Watchers sampling in Southport for probably four years now, documenting elevated levels of bacteria, specifically E. coli, on Cottage Creek. Um, and we <coughs> excuse me, brought that to the attention of the town, and they went ahead and did DNA sampling, which means they took bacteria, <coughs> sent it to a lab, and they, the lab looked at the DNA of the bacteria and were able to determine that there was a significant amount of human copies of DNA, meaning it's, coming, it's a human source. Um, so then the question is, is it old? Is it ongoing? Is it septic related? Is it sewerage infrastructure? <coughs> so I went back after that and did, um, I used a, a, a device called a fluorometer, which reads optical brighteners, which are compounds found in detergents that make your clothes, or excuse me, clothes kind of still pop after they've been washed, they don't fade as much. Um, they have a very short lifespan in the environment. And uh, Dr. Mike Mallon at UNCW came out with this paper that essentially said, if you show elevated levels of op optical brighteners, OBs, and bacteria at the same time, it is an indicator of sewage contamination. So this kind of, this graph on the right is kind of hard to read, but for, for reference, an OB is in the blue and the bacteria is in red. If an OB is approaching 30, it's considered elevated. So, and if a bacteria, if, he, if the bacteria level is above 235, it's considered elevated. So we're showing at each site elevated OBs, elevated bacteria, elevated OBs, elevated bacteria. So every time I sampled, and I did this two days, um, weeks apart, every single site had elevated levels of OBs and elevated levels of bacteria. So to, to us, that's an indicator of an ongoing issue. Um, because again, those OBs break down in the environment re really quickly. So um, we've since met with DEQ, we've met with Brunswick County Health Department, we've met with the town. Um, they've worked with us on this. Uh, and so we're essentially going to work with Dr. Mallon to come up with a sampling plan, which would then dictate when signage is put up around the creek to keep people safe and keep people from recreating in it. And they're also, DEQ is going to do some additional, additional sampling downstream where they're installing a public kayak launch. And so none of this would have been possible without Creek Watchers doing their work um, and taking their samples. And again, we're not a regulatory program, but that doesn't mean we can't use our data to advocate for regulatory organizations to do their job to, um, to uh, implement solutions. So, <coughs> excuse me, the next program I want to talk about is Swim Guide. So Swim Guide is a water quality monitoring program. It's designed to provide the public with up-to-date uh, information on bacteria levels in, in recreational waters. So, I would go out in the uh, warm months, which is April through October, and sample seven sites across New Hampshire County where people recreate. This right here is Archie Blue Park, if you are familiar with Archie Blue up on the north side. A lot of people fish there, a lot of people kayak there. I think we do a kayak there. Um, we launch out of there and go down Smith Creek. But um, you know, you want to give the public up-to-date levels of bacteria um, so they can have, make educated decisions on when and where they want to recreate. Um, this is part of a larger program that we do with all the other river keepers across the state. Um, and so we come up with basically a report at the end of the year that shows all the different levels across the state. Um, again, provides the public with information to keep them safe, but it's also an educational tool to discuss um, issues related to bacteria and water quality. Um, and so this, this is an example of that, this picture on the right. 
This is our uh, swim guide graphic. At the time we were sampling inland a little bit, <coughs> excuse me, but you have the physical locations here on the map. And then over here you have your NPNs. And you know, we obviously use pretty standard colors. Green is good, red is bad. Um, so lots of low levels here. We had one elevated sample up at Archie Blue Park, which historically is, uh, deals with a lot more bacterial issues um, than a lot of our other sites. So this is an example of that education piece and that um, public safety piece all in one nice graphic. So what are we looking for? So again, same bacteria, E. coli in freshwater and pterococcus in brackish water, but we're also using the YSI, which is a multi-probe water quality reading tool. It reads pH, temperature, salinity, conductivity, and dissolved oxygen. And those are good um, parameters to kind of just test the, the, the health of the water. Um, so they can tell you different things essentially. So getting, getting the YSI in the water twice a month is really good to build up that water quality data. Um, again, two times a month from April to October. This is obviously Greenfield Lake um, at the Boathouse. And that's another one of our sites. That's just a picture of the YSI that I included. Um, it's really nice. Like it's all these uh, metal rods right here are probes. So with one instrument, you have the ability to measure a bunch of different water quality parameters. When I worked at a private lab, I basically had an individual instrument for each probe. So it's just really convenient. It puts it all in one. Uh, it's a super useful tool. Uh, lab work, essentially the same. So this is our data from last year. Uh, so we had seven sites sampled two times a month. 39 samples were taken. 67 passed. 67% passed. 23% failed. <coughs> And so you can see that large discrepancy in the pass failure rate compared from creek watchers compared to swim guide. And that mostly has to do with when people do creek watcher sampling, they're sampling typically in a smaller body of water versus when I go sample Greenfield Lake, that's a large volume of water. And with that large volume, you have dilution, which decreases the pollution. Um, so that's typically why we see a higher pass fail rate. Um, still would like to see it higher than that. But um, we are in the middle of trying to secure more funding for the program. As of right now, we're not going to be doing it this, following, this coming year, but um, potentially looking at opportunities and sources of funding to keep it going. Yeah? Tom, when, it, when something fails, do you grade the failure as a really bad failure? Or yeah. Failure? Yeah, n not really levels. We have that threshold. So it's 104 MPN for, BRAC, or for Enterococcus and 235 for um, E. coli. And so if it's over that th threshold, we just say it's elevated. They're not like levels of elevated, even though like, yes, there are. There's a big difference between a, two, a sample that comes back with 237 and one that's maxed out, which would be greater than 24,700. So yeah, it, there definitely is a difference, but no, we just, it's, it's simpler to keep it with elevated, not elevated. Because if you get into like the tiered system and stuff, you know, it's just, it gets a little complicated. But yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, so bacteria, like, uh, bacteria can, I mean, it can, it's not, it's rare, but it can, you know, lead to death. But most likely what's going to happen, it, it, I'm not trying to scare you, that's not what's going to happen. <laughs> most likely what's going to happen is you're going to get in, like, if you ingest water with lots of uh, E. coli bacteria, you probably get an upset stomach and vomit and stuff like that. Um, you know, again, these are bacteria that occur in the guts of us at all times, but when they get into concentrated amounts, that's when you get into an issue. Um, you know, I'm sure you hear about like E. coli contamination of meat and things like that. Um, so they can make you really sick, but um, you know, not something that we've really come across too much. Again, it's more of an issue up in the Piedmont and mountains because a lot of the like a lot of the recreation that folks do in the water, swimming wise around here, is in the ocean, and you you don't really see a lot of elevated bacteria hits and DEQ samples, and they would put up postage if there was elevated levels of enterococcus. But because of that large volume of water, you don't tip, like after a hurricane, you probably would, but you know, it's different up in the French Broad where the, that's the main recreating source for people. And they do have elevated levels of bacteria and people do swim there because that's their only resource to recreate in. A lot of the recreation we have in our areas that we sample is like kayaking, fishing, things like that. So not a lot of opportunity to ingest the water. So that's why we don't see a lot of sickness from it. Um, but that being said, like when I worked up in Boone, um, the Watauga River, it was the primary recreating source. And I, when I worked at the health department, we would get calls all the time. Um, people like, you know, hey, I floated on the river all day and now I got a stomach issue going on. It's like, well, you know, you sat in the river for 10 hours and drank 30 beers, like, you know. 
<laughs> but yeah, like it's more of an issue up there than it is down here. But that's a good question. Um, okay, so the last program I'll talk about is our litter prevention program. So this is uh, it's a, it's a large program. It's it's multifaceted. It's not just cleanups. We do a lot of different things. But the goal is to reduce the litter that ends up in our watersheds. So we use passive litter collection devices, which we'll get into. Um, litter data collection, which is good for grant writing and education and policy work. Um, we do our cleanups, um, which I'll get into those. We have two different types. Um, and you know, advocacy and education in order to meet those goals. But the goal is to reduce the amount of litter we see in, in, in our local environment. Um, so why is this important? Cape Fear River Basin, most, like most basins in the United States, has a huge litter issue. Um, this right here is right outside of Satellite. Some of you all have been to this location before. Um, it's a storm drain right here, and this is what it looks like every time it rains. Um, this is one of our cleanup sites. Um, you know, litter is not just unsightly, which it is. That looks terrible. Um, but, you know, it can be harmful to aquatic organisms. Um, plastic, bacteria has the ability to colonize plastic based off its structure. So increased levels of litter can, especially plastic litter, can lead to increased levels of bacteria. Plastic breaks down to microplastics. Um, you know, litter as it breaks down in the environment can reduce harmful toxins in the air. It can lead to you know, mental health issues and things like that. So there's a lot of stuff that goes into litter that I don't think people think a lot about. They just say, oh, that looks bad. But uh, it, it's bad in a multitude of ways. So let me talk about our cleanups. So uh, we do our second Saturday cleanups. We do two cleanups a month, essentially. We do our second Saturday cleanups and our step cleanups. And I'll get into the, the step cleanups in a little bit and their uniqueness. Um, so in 2023, we collected over 24,000 pounds of litter and that includes recycling uh yeah which is like the most we've ever done i think the year in 2022 we did about 17,000, uh which is crazy um but i think you know cleanups are great um it's a great way to get involved with the community it's a great way to like physically obviously physically remove litter um, but cleanups alone are not adequate in solving the problem and anybody who does cleanups which is some folks in here that do cleanups they'll tell you that especially if they've been to a location multiple times, we'll go, we'll clean it up, we'll come back eight months later, and the same, if not more, is there again. So we really want to, re we our, the goal is source reduction. We want to eliminate the amount of litter that's making its way into the environment at the source versus trying to clean up after the fact. Um, but, you know, it also, is, it changes people's perspective on litter. So again, if, if somebody's new to cleanups and they come out to a cleanup and they bust their butt for two hours and we take out a thousand pounds of trash and they come back eight months later, that place that they cleaned up, and there's 1,200 pounds of trash there now, and they bust their butt for another two hours, it's kind of like, uh, you know, it's, it's, it can change someone's perspective and, and say, okay, well, we, we need to look at more systemic solutions here in source reduction because, you know, I, you know, we're coming out here every single time and the litter just keeps coming back and back and back. And so this is a large group we had last summer, I believe. This is out by the Good Shepherd Center off of uh, the railroad tracks. <coughs> um, so, yeah, that's kind of what it looks like. I highly recommend coming to them if you haven't. Uh, they're a lot of fun, believe it or not. <laughs> I mean, it's a good. I, I'm not that. F I don't have a lot of jokes, but no music. Um, yeah, Bob the Blob. He'll be out there. We find some weird stuff. I don't want to scare him away. We're trying to get him to come. Yeah, yeah. If you're into, if yeah, if you're into some, yeah. I haven't found anything too valuable yet, but <laughs> you guys, whatever you find, you can keep. Um, oh, you didn't tell me that. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's the thing. Everybody finds something valuable, they just don't tell me about it. Um, anyway, so yeah, every second Saturday, we're doing one next month at Squash Branch. It's going to be a kayak cleanup, so if you have a kayak and you want to clean up with it, you're more than welcome to come. Um, yeah, great way to meet like-minded people, and we can always use the help. It takes a lot of work to remove 24,000 pounds. It's not possible without uh, volunteers and members. <coughs> so uh, I wanted to get into our second style of cleanup. Um, this is a little bit abstract. Um, but basically we did, and we're not doing them now because the encampment's closed. But um, we did probably a year and a half of what I called were step cleanups. Um, and I first wanted to highlight uh, this gentleman right here, Tone McDuff. Uh, that's him right there in the picture. We were at an encampment. Um, so this has to do with the unhoused population in Wilmington. Um, 
if anybody, if, again, if you've come to our cleanups, you know that our work intersects with the unhoused community. That's basically because of where we clean up and the nature of our cleanups. Um, and so we were having some issues where folks were, you know, accidentally like picking something up that was somebody's possessions, but it looked like trash. Um, and so I got Tone out, and Tone worked for an organization called Vigilant Hope, and he actually was unhoused himself. Um, he's since passed away, but he was unhoused himself. So it was uh, getting him to come out and speak to the volunteer base and kind of explain what it's like to be in that position, how that litter accumulates, and how can we better identify what's trash and what's not so we don't run into the situation where somebody accidentally grabs a bag that has somebody's possessions in it. So we did a lot of work with that to kind of, you know, mold that program. Um, but that relationship led to him basically asking me like, hey, you know, one of the main problems with encampments, the reason they get shut down is because the litter accumulates. And he asked if I could help with that. And so we started doing cleanups at a couple different encampments, but the main one was out at MLK and Kerr. Um, and we worked with, and some of y'all were out there, we basically worked with the folks living out there to help with work side by side with them to help keep their space clean. Um, it was beneficial for us and the environment as we were moving litter and it was beneficial for the folks that were living out there so they didn't have to live amongst trash. Um, but, <coughs> excuse me, um, <coughs> we learned a lot doing this, this project. Um, and, you know, again, we'll probably continue to do it. Uh, we don't have anywhere to work right now, but um, learned a lot. You know, the question of is it an individual issue or is it a systemic issue? Is it the individual failure of the person in that situation? Is that why the litter is there? Or is there a larger systemic thing over top of this that's leading to that litter? And, you know, after doing a year and a half of work, working in these spaces side by side with these people, you know, I, I, I've landed here. Um, and some of the things I'd like to highlight to consider, um, you know, if you see an encampment or something like that, <clears throat> You know, just try and put yourself in the shoes of these people that are out there. Um, you know, they don't have a regular trash pickup service. So everybody here has a curbside pickup service. I'm sure I know I do. Um, what I would say to folks is, you know, just don't roll out, or don't roll out your um, roll off bin for three weeks and see how much accumulates. Um, it's inevitable. If you don't have something to regularly pick up your trash, it's going to accumulate. Um, it very much wasn't that folks wanted that trash to be there. In fact, lots of them would uh, go and try and find private dumpsters and stuff to, to throw this trash away, but then you run the risk of, hey, you might get arrested if you do that, and that's what leads to a whole other issues. Um, two, one thing that I noticed is when you live outside, you're living in the elements, which is naturally going to lead to the breaking down of a lot of your personal possessions. You know, clothes aren't going to last as long when you're outside in the elements all the time, your tent, things like that. So that leads to a lot of litter accumulation. And then another thing, um, you know, is there's no kitchen there, there's no refrigerator. So a lot of the things you're relying on are non-perishables, which inherently lead to more single-use plastic packaging, things like that. So a lot of these things kind of added up um, to what it kind of looked like working out there. And um, again, working out there and doing this work really highlighted that, you know, it's not this individual failure of somebody, it's more the system that they're operating in, which leads to that. And you know, I think that environmental organizations have a unique role here because a lot of the times uh, people will justify certain actions uh, against the unhoused community based off of the environmental argument. And I argue the opposite. Um, you know, I would say if you have like a space that we were working out of, you know, it's not ideal, it's not what we want to see, but if you're going to go through and clear something, like at least when I worked out of there before it, the population got to the point where we couldn't keep up, you know, it was a self-sustaining cycle. I would go out and do a cleanup once a month with the folks and we talk and make and build relationships and other organizations would do their necessary work. We were a very niche role of just trash. Um, but, you know, I, I distributed bags and everything was bagged up and I hauled it off and it was no big deal. Like it was a self-sustaining cycle and then it got too big and we couldn't keep up. But, you know, when somebody says, oh, we need to shut this down because of the litter issue, what I would say to them is, well, well, now, you know, I was working in a place where that litter was accumulated in one spot and I could build relationships with people and I could work with them and we could keep the place clean. But now they're, that 5,000 pounds of trash that we've taken out of that space together collectively um, was in one spot and now it's in 100 different spots across the county. Mm -hmm. So I think there's, you know, 
people don't really think about it. They just want the problem gone. And those are th some things I think that people should consider, you know, especially the individual versus systemic. And then, you know, how do we look at this issue and what's our unique role in this, in this issue? And so um, this is one of our new flyers we have. So uh, Liz Carbone works at Good Shepherd. Um, she comes, her and her partner come to uh, cleanups quite a bit. Um, and so she helped design, or she designed this for me essentially. Um, you know, helpful tips and unhelpful tips when cleaning up around unhoused folks. Um, you know, just, you know, what you should do, what you shouldn't do. And then, you know, a little descriptor about what we kind of talked about. And like, you know, we all hate litter. We don't want to see it in our watersheds, but this is kind of the situation that we're in. And we're going to do the best that we can in the conditions that we have. Um, so, uh, yeah, again, all stem from this gentleman right here and kind of really started the whole program. And I would say it's been pretty successful. Um, it's, 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 a di it's, it's a difficult job, but um, a good one and I think a necessary one. So moving on to our passive litter collection devices. So we have our litter traps, which are um, curbside inlet uh, trash capturing devices. Uh, they're made by a company called EnviroPod, which is a New Zealand based company. Um, they're kind of all across the globe. We're a little behind the ball with this. Uh, California is on the way, I think, to implementing them into their stormwater BMP. So once that happens, I think they'll catch on all across the country. We were the first ones to install them in North Carolina. We have 14 of them installed, 10 of them with the Burntmo Creek Restoration Project. Um, and then four were initially installed as like a pilot project to test their efficacy. Um, basically, I don't know if you can see, but you know, as it rains, uh, stormwater, you know, there's a grate normally here. It's off obviously, but you know, as it rains, stormwater and litter make their way into the storm drain system. The storm drain system is directly or indirectly connected to the creeks. So, you know, if you're in the Burnt Mill Creek watershed, every drop of water that falls on anything eventually makes its way into Burnt Mill Creek. You can do that directly or you can do it indirectly through the storm drain system. And so you want to naturally stop that litter before it makes its way into the creek. And that's what this device does. Um, it has an overflow valve here, so it doesn't back up. It can hold up to 350 pounds and only needs to be maintained quarterly. Um, so. I'd say the biggest pain in the butt is these grates weigh like 100 pounds. <laughs> so that's not fun. Um, but we've Kemp designed like a little dolly device for me. So, and Hannah's helped me with that. So she knows how difficult it can be. Um, but they work pretty good. Um, they're really good at um, catching. Yeah. I just wonder, how much does something like that cost? Yeah, so it's about like 500 to $600 for a uh, piece. Yep. Yeah. How deep is that? It catches that much water. <coughs> it's pretty deep. So like it has to be installed in a storm drain that's like at least 48 inches deep. But that when you get it, the, 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 the catch net is like this and it, it expands probably down to here. Yeah. Yeah. So 14 are just in this area or is that throughout yeah. all the riverkeeper? So um, I don't think any other riverkeeper organizations have these. Um, but we have one down at Waterline. So if you're going down there to get a beer later, check it out. There's a sign there too. That was more for educational purposes. So Marissa could take kids down there and they could check it out and just the visibility of it. Um, the other one's outside of the husk, if you know where the husk is. Um, that one's a good litter gator spot. Yeah, lots of <laughs> bottle caps and fairy hair. <laughs> Nothing valuable yet, though. <laughs> I, um, no, uh-uh. Yeah, um, not yet. I'm just kidding. I don't, I don't think that I will. Um, the drain goes back over top of that. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's blocked oh, off. It yeah, uh-huh. No, that would be like a... We would get sued. Somebody would step in there. Yeah. Um, so, sorry, to your question. Um, so there's two in Wilmington. The, the initial project was four, two in Wilmington and then two in Leland. And we worked with both the town of Leland and the city of Wilmington. And the goal, the idea, the project was to test the efficacy of the devices, but also to kind of entice the, because like I, we should not be maintaining these all the time. It's a lot of work. I wanted to show the town and the city that, hey, because they have vacuum trucks. They could essentially, two workers could drive up, lift that grate, vacuum it out. You know, when Han and I do it, we're lifting the grate and we're taking litter data and collecting litter data to like show people and say, this is how much this is collected, this is why you should do it. Um, but this would be a good, like they do uh, across the world and what they're gonna do in California is, you know, the street sweeper cycles, you could get on a vacuum truck cycle, do these quarterly, put them on a schedule, pop the grate off and suck them off and you'd be good. But that, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of difficult to do for us. Um, but, that hasn't really worked out yet. They're kind of not, you know, into that idea yet, but we're working on it. But there's 10 other ones along the Burnt Mill Creek watershed um, that 
we have installed that we maintain as part of the restoration project. So the majority are in Wilmington. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's a lot. Right? Yeah, we're just that we're probably capped at 14. Yeah. Um, so here is the floating trash capture device, which we have three. <coughs> excuse me, we have three of these. Two or all three are in the Burnt Mill Creek watershed. Yeah, that's Bob the Blob, <laughs> which is he's right here now. <laughs> um, so, sorry. <laughs> so we originally, this, this project started with a professionally made one, um, and that's in the freshwater portion of Burmo Creek. Works really good. The problem was it was really expensive. And so I and a friend who's an engineer, he lives like right up Castle Street actually, we built two ourselves. They don't look as cool and as nice, <laughs> but they work just as good. So this one right here is in Rankin Street. Uh, if you are familiar with Rankin, where McCumber's Branch flows under the road, just on the uh, uh, downstream side of that. Um, and so it, it collects a boatload of litter here. Um, it collects floatables only. Um, this is not sealed on the bottom, so fish and turtles and alligators can swim in and out. It doesn't collect animals or anything like that. It just collects floatable litter. Um, but yeah, they, we, we've got three of them. Two of them were part of the Burnt Mill Creek Restoration Project. Um, and then the other one was uh, part of a microplastic study. Yeah? How does flooding like, over the river affect those? Yeah, so good questions. Oh, whoa, well, crap. Whoa, OK. OK, so good question. So these are the posts right here. Um, and so they're uh, cemented in the ground. And then there's this cable right here, which connects these floats. But there's enough play in the cables that this rises and falls with water level. So it, it's, it's, it's maneuverable. Um, you know, we're possibly going to have to consider taking them out for hurricanes, but they've already gone through multiple, multiple inch storms. And it hasn't been an issue yet. Um, I was going to ask, how often do you have to re remove the trash? Yeah. That's a good question. So this one at Rankin is almost after every storm because of, and I'll get into that in a little bit in a project hopefully we're going to be working on. Um, but, <coughs> excuse me, this one's tidal. So like the trash will go in. That's what happened here. So the trash went in and then it tidally dropped back out. Uh, the other section is uh, fresh water, so it stays in there. So this one we like to hit after every rain to make sure we're capturing that trash and doesn't float back out with the tide. But for the freshwater ones, you know, getting them quarterly is not a big deal. Dep it's all rain dependent. You know, if you're in a hurricane season, you're gonna do it more, but yeah. So, you know, the purpose, we wanna raise awareness uh, about the issue. Um, one statistic that I like that has been consistent through all the data collection, and one thing I didn't talk about is we also do litter transects. So we divide the, the creek up into three 30 meter sections um, and collect litter data in them. And whether it's a transect or it's, um, you know, uh, a litter trap uh, maintenance or just all my data compiled, roughly 80 to 85 percent of all of the litter we find is plastic of some kind. So that's really the major issue, um, which leads to a bunch of different issues as well. And again, the goal is uh, systemic solutions and source reduction. We don't want to just do a bunch of litter traps. We don't want to do a bunch of litter getters. We don't want to do a bunch of cleanups. We want to reduce the amount of litter we're seeing in the environment. And the best way to do that is to turn off the tap at the top, which is obviously the hard part, too. Yeah. Or it would have been done by now. Um, but all that work below builds to that, ideally, with that data collection, with that um, getting people engaged with the issue, with changing people's perspectives on the issue. All of that eventually, hopefully, leads to source reduction. Um, you know, we want to uh, address infrastructure. Um, uh, and discrepancies in infrastructure. Uh, we did a project uh, about a year and a half ago now where we looked at bus stop infrastructure. Um, this was a project that kind of stemmed from Tone as well, talking about discrepancies in litter infrastructure based off of um, socioeconomic factors. Um, and so he was basically saying, um, you know, that in certain parts of, of Wilmington there's going to be less litter infrastructure than others, which makes complete sense. Um, and so we did a project related to that. We worked with a UNCW sociology student. We collected litter data at uh, over half of the bus stops in Wilmington and also collected uh, the infrastructure and documented what we saw there. And what the data showed was an elevated level of 
litter at bus stops in lower socioeconomic areas, um, which would also, there was a, a discrepancy in litter. There's less likely to be a trash bin there. And so, you know, obviously people in lower socioeconomic areas are going to rely on public transit more. So that's a compounding, compounding issue, which led to more litter on the ground, which leads to a whole bunch of different issues. Um, but we sat down with the wave and now they, they were already doing this. They're already putting counters on the bus so they can start keeping track of what their heaviest bus stops uh, were so they could allocate appropriately. But they're also uh, agreed to do equity studies. So they're going to look at um, average household income, vehicle availability, uh, and I believe one other indicator that I can't remember right now, but essentially use that to dictate where they put infrastructure. So instead of just randomly putting it around at a bus stop that nobody's going to use, they're going to ideally put it in the places that need it. Um, and you know, all this, all this litter data and litter work is also great for uh, writing grants. And here's just a visual representation of that 85%. You know, everything <coughs> shaded in blue is plastic of some kind. You know, we have plastic film, hard plastic, styrofoam, and then over here in this small sliver right here, this 15% sliver, you got glass, metal, and other. So yeah, the plastic is a huge issue. So the last thing I'll talk about um, is, and we just turned the grant in uh, last, this week, sorry. And basically, we're, I, one thing that we've noticed anecdotally through doing all this work is there's higher amounts of litter in areas of lower socioeconomic status than in higher. And you know, just like the unhoused work we do, we don't, it's not, we don't believe it stems from individual choice. There's systemic things that are happening that are leading to that trend. Um, we looked at our data and our data backed that up. So that Rankin Street litter gitter that y'all saw where this guy came from, <laughs> I got one up at Metz, which is higher socioeconomic area versus Rankin, which is lower socioeconomic area. And the contrast is stark. I mean, we're pulling over 2,000 pounds or 2,000 individual items from Rankin versus we're sub 500 at Metz. And so trying to figure out why that is. And again, it's not, it's not individual, it's systemic based. Um, and so we wrote a grant to basically study that. And there's scholarly research that backs this up. Um, but the, the purpose of the grant is to essentially um, we're going to take four sites across Wilmington, two higher socioeconomic, two lower, do very specific cleanups at them called ETAP, which is a Escape Trash Assessment Protocol, which is EPA's designed preferred method to collect data from cleanups. It's very labor intensive, so we need lots of help with that. Um, but it's really good at documenting litter that you find at cleanups, helping you identify sources, because you're not just doing a cleanup, you're looking around, you're saying, oh, you know, what's the litter infrastructure like around here? What are the uses around here? Um, and then it's designed to make data comparable across site. So we're going to use the ETAP cleanups at four different sites and compare what we find. And we use a tool called, <coughs> excuse me, EJ Screen, which is another EPA tool. Um, and so we can basically look at socioeconomic indicators based off of a GIS mapping tool. And so one of our sites is going to be the basically south side of town, um, where we've done a lot of cleanup work. And the other side is going to be um, in a higher socioeconomic area just north of that. And so you can see the indicators are, are incredibly stark. You know, your low income percent at the higher SES is, is 11% versus 64% in South Side. Your people of color is 82% versus 10%. So it's an environmental justice issue. This litter burden is falling on the shoulders of communities of color, and it's not so on. Um, but, you know, these all these different indicators, I mean, you're... you're Life expectancy is, is insane. Your per capita income is insane. Um, you know, there's all these stark differences here, and we want to look at how are some of these things contributing to the litter we're seeing, and then ideally through that work, with the help of the UNCW Sociology Department, we're going to be partnering with Dr. Brock Turnus, who is the environmental sociologist there. He's going to do his sociology work and his survey work, and we're going to do our environmental work. And hopefully from all that, we can kind of identify some of the systemic reasons behind the discrepancy in litter that we're seeing and use that report as leverage to go to the appropriate entities and say, hey, how can we address this? What can we do differently to make sure that this litter issue isn't just dis disproportionately falling on the shoulders of folks in low, uh, lower socioeconomic areas and communities of color? Um, and so, you know, this is, this is just the, <coughs> excuse me, the litter traps we have. You know, these are in our higher SES areas and these are in our lower. These are average number of pieces per maintenance. So you can see the, the difference there visually. 
Um, yeah, so <coughs> we'll see if we get that grant. Um, if not, there may be some other folks that might be interested. So um, I'm really interested in doing this work. Um, and so we'll try and get it funded one way or another. But that's all I got. I don't, I don't know. I wasn't really keeping track how long I went. But um, I got cards up here if anybody wants them. Um, that's my email if you want to reach out. Um, again, you can see me at the second Saturday cleanups. Um, love to have you all there. And um, if you're interested in Creek Watchers, let me know. Um, but yeah, if anybody has any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them.